Well, good evening, Brian, to the Lodge Hope of Karachi, number 337, and our 43rd lockdown lecture series of Zoom meetings. Uh, Brian, I, I really had hoped that this would have been a, a bit of a celebration this evening to, to commemorate uh, St John's Day, uh, particularly as we were, uh, were not meeting as normal. But as many of you will have seen, that tragically last evening, our Director of Ceremonies has passed away with a, a major heart attack. Uh, Brian, I don't propose to go into too much detail just now. Uh, I do propose to have a few minutes silence, however, but I would invite anyone after the meeting this evening, after the recording has uh, finished, if they'd like to stay on and we can have some uh, reminiscing about Brother Drew. Um, with that said, Brian, I, can I yet yeah, once again welcome you to the Lodge Hope of Karachi and remind you all of the Grand Lodge of Scotland guidelines on Zoom meetings. Please can you keep your cameras on uh, when possible. If your broadband does drop out, that is understandable, but please have a name that I recognise in the screen. Thank you, Brian. Can I also ask you, uh, please, can you sign the virtual tile on our Facebook pages so we have got a record for our history? Uh, Brian, uh, afterwards, the question answers, can I ask you to please put them in the chat box and I will moderate the questions and answers with Brother Adam Bruce afterwards. Brian, that being said, can I ask you to bow your heads for a few minutes of respect to departed merit? Thank you, Brian. I did consider earlier on this morning, Brian, I, whether or not we should postpone this evening's meeting. But I know for certain that Drew would have been the first one to tell me not to be a stupid laddie and just go ahead with it, particularly in the COVID pandemic that we find. So it is a great delight to welcome along this evening to speak to us, the master of one of their sister research lodges, uh, brother Honourable Adam Bruce, who's well known to many of you. Uh, Adam works in the renewable energy sector, uh, so uh, in many ways the future's in his hands, Brian, and he may touch on that this evening. Uh, in Scottish civic life, he's a unicorn persuadant, and he's a, a solicitor, but we won't hold that against him, Brian. Uh, and I'm not sure if Adam remembers, uh, we first met probably about 25, 26 years ago when he was a, a young trainee solicitor at Murray and Donald up in St Andrews, when I worked for the Association for International Cancer Research. Uh, quite a, a time ago, Adam, in a different world for you, no doubt. Uh, so Brian, it gives me the greatest of pleasure to hand over the floor to our guest this evening, Brother Adam Bruce. Thank you, Roy Worshipful Master. It's a, it's a pleasure, a real pleasure, to be invited to speak at uh, Lord, Lodge Hope of uh, Karachi this evening. And may I extend the condolences of, uh, of my lodge, uh, Lodge Sir Robert Murray, to you all uh, this evening. Um, and I'm also sorry that COVID has eliminated the possibility of a, of a mutual visit uh, this year, but I am honoured and I am delighted to be offered the opportunity to share some thoughts on the life and times of Sir Robert Murray with you and to enlist you as early peer reviewers of those thoughts. I am, right worshipful master, asking you and the brethren here present to mark my homework. But before I do, let me say something about the context for these random jottings. Two years ago, Lodge Sir Robert Murray celebrated its 50th birthday, as did I, and by a happy coincidence, the petition to establish the Lodge passed the committee at Grand Lodge on the same day that I was born, into the worst of winter storms and living memory in January 1968. Through a combination of happenstance and design, we've sought to learn more about Sir Robert and his times through the lens of our half-centenary celebrations. In 2018, we visited Newcastle to explore the ground on which the Scots Army, of which he was General of Ordnance, camped in 1641 as it laid siege to that city. It was in a tent somewhere in the artillery lines that he was initiated into the Lodge of Edinburgh by the stonemasons serving as technicians of the siege train. 
the first recorded admission of a non-operative Mason into a Scottish lodge and the first degree awarded by a Scottish lodge in England. After some leisurely investigation led by the engaging local historian Dan Jackson, we determined the likely location of the ritual on the high ground overlooking the city, somewhere on or about the centre circle of what is now St James's Park, the home of Newcastle United FC. The next year we ventured to Granton here in Edinburgh to the collection centre of the National Museums of Scotland, and there we inspected the newly acquired seagoing clock, of which more later, built to a design inspired by Murray in a quest to solve the mysteries of longitude. These days out and our discussions of Murray's life and times have inspired the members of our lodge to embark on a wider research project which should result in the production of a series of papers and perhaps even a conference and certainly a dinner. As master I got to choose my contribution and perhaps rashly offered to write an introduction, placing Murray into the wider context of the long 17th century into which he was born and died. So this evening I've attempted to draw some of these initial workings together. They are very much uh, rough ashlar, but I hope that there is a structure to them that will lead to something more substantial. It all begins in Curus, our story that is. Curus, that small and perfectly formed village on the north bank of the River Forth, or as an anonymous commentator wrote in 1900, a decayed royal borough containing many old houses. Many of you will know it, some of you may actually live there. Several of you will have visited and may have taken in Curus Palace. Some of you will have ducked on entering the ground floor, but some of you may not have done so and still bear the scar. It was the home of my forebear, George Bruce, and it's here that we'll begin this evening's reflections. But before we do, I want to drag you away from admiring the painted ceilings, the basic but revolutionary plumbing, and even Sir George's study and strong room, and ask you briefly to consider the sequence of the industrial revolutions that we have experienced since the first. The first industrial revolution, broadly speaking, is the one that most of us know, the economic and societal convulsion that occurred first here in Great Britain, fueled by coal, powered by steam and conveyed on iron rails. The second, again, broadly speaking, was powered not by coal, but by oil and gas, driving the mass production of consumer goods that we most closely identify with the United States. The third occurred in the recent past and brought into our lives electronics, telecommunications and computers. It globalized the economy and its common currency is silicon. And the fourth is now with us, but what is it? In the words of Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, host of the annual Davos conference, now a fourth industrial revolution is building on the third, the digital revolution that has been occurring since the middle of last century. It is characterized by a fusion of technologies that is blurring the lines between the physical, the digital and biological spheres. Or put another way, the fourth industrial revolution is melding the digital world with the physical world in which we live. It is the new system of the world and thankfully not the subject of this year's lecture, this evening's lecture even. Instead, let us return to the beginning. In the 17th century, a set of even more profound changes occurred, which helped to spur the first industrial revolution and the enlightenment that paralleled it. These changes encompassed science, commerce, the law, and were essentially the building blocks of modern Western culture. During Murray's lifetime, something profound happened in the British Isles. As Professor Jonathan Israel puts it in his work, Radical Enlightenment, Philosophy and the Making of Modernity, down to around 1650, Western civilization was based on a largely shared core of faith, tradition and authority. By contrast, after 1650, everything, no matter how fundamental or deeply rooted, was questioned in the light of philosophical reason and frequently challenged or replaced by startlingly different concepts generated by the new philosophy and what may still be usefully termed as the scientific revolution. This then was the new system of the world that Robert Murray helped to shape. But let us return to Curus. I think we can safely presume that some of this was in the contemplation of George Bruce in 1597 as he walked through the front door of his newly built palazzo on the banks of the River Forth. Being a mere five foot two, he had no need to duck. 
Potentially in contemplation was a volume of Vitruvius's De Architectura, or hero of Alexandria's Pneumatica, both of which had recently been translated in, into English, and which allowed a mathematically minded merchant in Curus to commission the first ever water lifting devices seen in Scotland, devices which had been invented to lift and deposit the waters of the Nile on the crops on its banks, now lifted the brackish water from the seams of George Bruce's coal workings. Where the monks of Curus had dug coal on the surface, now Bruce was able to mine the coal, following its veins deeper underground and soon out under the river itself. And this newly reapplied mathematical knowledge led to further innovation in navigation, allowing Bruce to export his coal and salt further across northern Europe. It led to the discovery of new technology, such as that later produced at the Caron Ironworks across the river, and which, using a combination of the new sciences of ballistics and metallurgy, enabled the Royal Navy to better rule the waves and to police the ever-growing trading networks of the new mercantile communities across Britain. Underpinning these developments and metaphorically underpinning these developments and physically underpinning Bruce's coal workings were the rather more boring but vital innovations in commercial law. Simply put, security of tenure gave owners the incentive to invest in long term projects. Scots law gave rights underground to the landowner and not the crown. As one commentator wrote recently in making the West and Western science, mortgages and mineral rights matter at least as much as theology, Calvinist or otherwise. Talking of the crown, here we get to observe another first. Everything worth celebrating in life can be traced back to Curus, except the witchcraft trials, which we'll gloss over. The first ever royal visit, perhaps. Certainly the first ever royal visit to an industrial site. In 1617, just over 400 years ago, King James VI and I arrived in Curris to inspect George Bruce's coal workings, and in particular the Moat Pit, which had its entrance in an artificial river, uh, artificial island in the river. The monarch entered the workings from landside and disappeared underground, emerging through the Moat Pit above the water, some yards out from shore. It's said that the king traumatized by two attempts to kidnap him in his youth, was seized with emotion and refused all attempts to convince him to step off into the vessel that was to take him back shore. Instead, the royal party made its way back underground and out the way it came. Recovered from his ordeal, the king knighted the now Sir George and doubtless repaired to Curra's palace for refreshment. Two years later, the king's daughter Elizabeth, born in Falkland, but now living in Heidelberg as the wife of the Elector Palatine, persuaded her husband to accept the offer of the crown of Bohemia. Within a year of their coronations in Prague, the army of King Frederick and Queen Elizabeth was comprehensively and utterly defeated at the Battle of the White Mountain by Imperial Habsburg forces. The great European war of religion that tore kingdoms, principalities, states and cities apart, convulsed the continent for 30 years. In his magisterial global crisis, war, climate change and catastrophe in the 17th century, Professor Geoffrey Parker sets out how a period of acute climate change, which we now know as the Little Ice Age, precipitated convulsions across the globe, not just in Europe. In 1653, Jean-Nicolas de Parival, writing in Brussels, described how he was living in an iron century when the elements, servants of an irate god, combined to snuff out the rest of humankind. Mountains spew fire, the earth shakes, plague contaminates the air, and a continuous rain causes rivers to flood. In China, the Ming dynasty fell, Japan was rent by rural insurrection as crops failed and over half a million people died. The Mughal Empire in India was savaged by civil war and civil strife tore through Spain, France, Portugal and the Kingdom of Naples. And the British Isles were not immune. And yet in the middle of civil war or the Bishop's War or the War of the Three Kingdoms, depending on how you like your history, there were those who found what we might now call a safe space to search for an alternative society that sought rational answers to the events of the previous half century and didn't seek to pin them on an irate god. So we must return to Curus as one such was, was George Bruce's grandson Alexander, 
who struck up an unlikely friendship with another Scottish polymath, Robert Murray, a man who flipped through the pages of the histories of the Thirty Years' War like the Scarlet Pimpernel. You seek him here, you seek him there, the damn Habsburgs seek him everywhere. In a recent book on the life of General Alexander Leslie, perhaps the most influential and successful of all the Scots officers in that long 17th century, Professor Steve Murdoch of St Andrews University writes of the Thirty Years' War that that same European tragedy gave rise to a professional soldiering class, the likes of which Scotland had probably never seen before. This, in turn, helped to shape the course of Scottish, English and Irish history through their actions in the British Civil Wars. Robert Murray was more than a simple soldier. Yes, he rose to senior rank as uh, in command of the French Garde Écossaise. After his role in the Scots army in 1641, he was reconciled with King Charles I who knighted him, and he appears to have acted as a bridge between Cardinal Richelieu in France and King Charles. In 1643, he's back in France leading the Scots Guard, which saw action against the Spanish at the Battle of Roqua in May, and was then almost annihilated in the French defeat at the Battle of Tuttlingen that November, where Murray was captured and imprisoned by Imperial forces. He appears to have used his enforced idleness to read widely, particularly in emerging fields of mechanics, including the use of pendulums to aid navigation. By 1645, there were three Scottish armies in the field, one in England, one in Ireland, and one in the north of Scotland, chasing the Marquis of Montrose. The country needed senior commanders. Murray was ransomed, with the funds ostensibly paid by his cousin also, Robert Murray, who appears to have headed what we might now term the Scottish Chamber of Commerce in Paris. The bond of £16,000 Scots was underwritten by the Scottish Parliament. Back in the British Isles, Murray continued to act as a go-between linking the French administration with the diminishing circle around Charles I. Murray even tried to spring the king from house arrest before the Scots army to which he had surrendered handed him over to the Parliament of England. Murray spent the end of the 1640s in Scotland and was appointed to the Privy Council by the young King Charles II after his coronation at Schoon in 1650. He stayed in Scotland after the defeat of the Scots armies at Worcester and then at Dunbar, and we know he attended meetings of the Lodge of Edinburgh. But in 1652, personal tragedy struck, and he lost his wife in childbirth. Through the mid-1650s, we can see him trying to bring a sense of order to the otherwise factional and chaotic attempts to overthrow the Cromwellian Commonwealth in Scotland. The Royalist movement collapsed in on itself and Murray was denounced on the strength of a forged letter. He appealed directly to the young king, invoking a Masonic analogy. Having found me guiltless, your majesty may, as a master builder doth with his materials, most sovereignly dispose and determine my future. He took himself into internal exile, staying as the guest of Clan Ranald, the chief of the largest subdivision of Clan Donald in the Outer Isles, using his time to record the tidal races of Bernera, the flora and fauna on Uist and Harris, and even making a record of life on St Kilda. He later wrote papers on each of these subjects for the Royal Society and corresponded in detail with his contacts on the continent, particularly the great Jesuit scholar Athanasius Kircher who he met in France in the 1640s. In 1655, he came in, surrendering to General Monk and accepting an offer of exile. We next find him in Cologne in 1656 and his first surviving letter to Alexander Bruce is dated July 1657 from The Hague. The letters reveal a deep friendship. Bruce was the younger by 20 years and was at least initially in awe and perhaps suspicious of the older man. They wrote as friends do about life and present troubles. During the Cromwellian Commonwealth, Bruce also found himself in semi-exile in the Low Countries and married the daughter of the head of the Dutch Foreign Service. Through his wife, he met the extraordinary Huygens family, who will intrude back into our narrative in a moment. But their letters reveal a much more important facet of that friendship, their mutual interest in engineering, in science, and in what we would now call data. 
They discussed hydraulics and tidal power, how Bruce might yet improve the family coal and salt works at Curris. They speculated on the waxing and waning of Scotland's herring fisheries. They discussed heraldry, geometry, and occasionally politics. Above all, they strove for another form of society, another structure that would underpin existence that was immune to the religious enthusiasm that had enveloped Europe over the previous 50 years. After the restoration of Charles II, they combined with a small group of like-minded souls and on the 28th of November 1660, Bruce and Murray, along with 10 others, eight English, two Irish, formed what became the Royal Society. Murray also wrote to Bruce about Freemasonry. It's clear from his letters that he was deeply taken by the language, ritual and symbolism of the Lodge of Edinburgh. Their use of ritual and the accompanying words and symbols by the working or operative Masons allowed them to communicate their knowledge and experience to other stonemasons across the country long before the advent of curriculum vitae or certificates or even linked in. It was this early universal language that taught Murray and Bruce the importance of an ubiquitous and rational means of communication, a, a philosophical language. And together with the Huygenses, who were probably Europe's preeminent clock and astronomical device makers, they sought to make machines that would be governed by the same rules of logic and of mechanical language. They developed seagoing clocks to aid navigation and give the Royal Navy advantage over the Dutch and the French, as well, in, as, well as giving Bruce's Dutch in-laws an edge over their rivals in trading with that country's colonies. Here is an early practical example of the combination of science, in this case, theoretical physics, engineering and mechanics, and data, time, to deliver what we might today call real world benefit. From that moment forward, fewer and fewer maps would be marked terra incognita or, ev or even here be dragons. This investment by the Dutch in skilled operators and early machine learning had immediate benefits by the mid 17th century, it's estimated that the Dutch lost only one out of every 20 merchant ships that transited between the Netherlands and the Indies. Their great rivals, the Portuguese, who didn't focus on technology, lost one in three. One of the delights about being a trustee of the National Museums of Scotland is that we acquired one of the only two remaining seagoing clocks built by the Dutch master clockmaker Severin Ustervik to a design by Huygens, Murray and Bruce, and which is now on display in Chamber Street. At the heart of all their work was a striving to create machines powered by a new philosophic language, what we would now call computers and computer code. So we may claim George Bruce as the man who delivered the motive power, the coal, to fuel the first industrial revolution, his grandson Alexander and Robert Murray, along with their fellow savants of the Royal Society, can claim to be the fathers of artificial intelligence and machine learning that are powering the fourth industrial revolution. Necessity, it is said, is the mother of invention. Or as the 17th century playwright George Chapman wrote, the great mother of all productions, grave necessity. Or as Professor Parker put it, the great crisis of the long 17th century drove the search for rational and enlightened progress, a search some would say is still underway. One of the few pleasures of lockdown has been to reread the Baroque Cycle trilogy written by the American author Neil Stevenson. Ostensibly a lengthy and entertaining romp across a series of global landscapes populated by pirates and vagabonds, politicians and philosophers, heaving bosoms and heavy wigs, it takes its reader on a voyage through the final years of that long 17th century. I'd recommend the three books on the strength of the storytelling alone, but I do so on the basis that beneath the page turning chiaroscuro of noble heroes, brilliant heroines and cunning villains, lies what one critic has termed one of the greatest historical novels ever written. Its central theme is the evolution of the scientific revolution and the early enlightenment, one of progress from darkness into light. Just as in our story where Sir George Bruce's proto-mechanical mine workings were installed within a generation of the witchcraft panic that struck Curris in the late 16th century, so Stevenson's first book opens with a witch hanging 
and the third and final concludes with Newcommon's steam engine pumping water from a mine in Cornwall. Real life characters, particularly Isaac Newton and Godfrey Leibniz, are woven through all three books and one of the leading fictional players in the story is a founding member of the Royal Society. Although neither Robert Murray nor Alexander Bruce feature, Murray's role as president of the Royal Society is given to another fictional character. Several themes are explored through the trilogy, the struggle against arbitrary government and royal absolutism, whether in Great Britain or in France, the rise of the scientific method to which we'll return, the fight for religious freedom, the power of commerce and the rule of law and the evils of slavery. One of the stories explored across all three books is the long running dispute between Isaac Newton and Godfrey Leibniz, two of the greatest minds of their age. Both can be credited with the invention of calculus, with Newton expending more effort to discredit the discovery of Leibniz. While Newton often keep it, kept his work secret, only sharing fragments with the Royal Society, Leibniz pioneered what we would now term the process of peer review, sharing his half-formed theories with a network of correspondence across Europe. These were the fathers of what we'd term the empirical or experimental method in science, or natural philosophy as it was then known. The networks of correspondence that Stevenson ascribes to Leibniz are echoed in the letters between Murray and Alexander Bruce, and their own network that included the Huygens family, who in turn wrote regularly to Leibniz in real life. Reading the novels, it is as if Murray and Bruce are in an adjoining room, influencing the narrative, but never appearing in it. The other influence on the central theme of the novels is Freemasonry, even if like Murray and Bruce, it doesn't appear directly in the narrative. In describing the principles of the new scientific method, one of the characters states that a natural philosopher is one who tries to prevent his ruminations from straying by hewing to what can be observed and proving things where possible by rules of logic. Note the echo of the Shaw statutes and the workings of Masons and the rules by which they were to operate. This application of rules to encourage and not to discourage innovation lay at the heart of the early Enlightenment. As the late Professor Lisa Jardine put it in her own history of this period, Ingenious Pursuits Building the Scientific Revolution, our Western intellectual heritage has been shaped by ingenuity, quick wittedness, lateral thinking and inspired guesswork, but not haphazardly. In its detail, it is guided and given its informing values by a common code of practice, which is simply an extension of the rules that govern our everyday life. What did the operative masons of the Lodge of Edinburgh impart to Sir Robert Murray, if not a common code of practice, being the rules that governed their everyday life? These were the rules that underpinned the new system of the world. In the narrow sense, the title of the third part of Newton's Principia Mathematica, but for our purposes, a way of describing this new world of scientific method and of commerce, sustained by networks of information, by data, and ultimately by confidence and trust, which in turn encouraged investment and the essential workings of what we would now describe as the modern market economy. One of the networks that runs through all three novels is that of a family of Armenian, Armenian merchants who transact globally through kinship networks using a private language that protects them from what we would term cowans and eavesdroppers. So too, emerging out of the real 17th century, we can observe extended Masonic networks with their own signals and methods of recognition, and ultimately the sharing of the Mason word to give confidence to their dealings and the quality of their work. How these working networks of operative Masons became the philosophic networks of the Enlightenment is a subject for another time and another lecture. But I wanted to draw some threads together by reflecting on the words of my own father when he spoke at the 50th anniversary celebrations of the lodge which he founded in the name of Sir Robert Murray. One of the greatest joys of his 70 years in the craft, he observed, was the certainty that wherever in the world you met another brother, even if it was only fleetingly on the margins of a meeting, 
you knew that you were united by common bonds of brotherly love, bound together in a network that would have been recognized by Murray and his brethren in the 17th century. So Robert Murray died suddenly on the 4th of July, 1673, after dining with the Lord Chancellor, the Earl of Shaftesbury. On the King's command, he was buried in Westminster Abbey. His papers and the identity of his executors who took charge of them are sadly lost to history. Alexander Robertson, the young Carnegie scholar to Oxford University, who wrote Murray's biography as his be lit thesis in 1913, concluded that Sir Robert was of importance to the future and he is of the future. Throughout our extended 50th birthday celebrations, we've heard from scholars like Steve Murdoch of St Andrews University and Matthew Lee at Oxford on the military and intellectual networks that drew Scots like Murray into correspondence and commerce across the globe. The new system of the world, underpinned by the scholarship of Murray's contemporaries in and outside the Royal Society, is still observable today. We may be meeting by Zoom this evening, but one of the intellectual sparks that fired the fourth industrial revolution of which this is a part, was struck by the stonemasons of the Lodge of Edinburgh in a muddy field somewhere outside Newcastle in 1641, when they admitted Sir Robert Murray into membership. Right worshipful member, um, right worshipful master and brethren, thank you very much. Brother. Adam Bruce, thank you so much for a wonderful insight into the life and times of Robert Murray. I am sure that the Bren will agree with me that your homework this evening has certainly scored at least an A. And because you've given up your precious family time during the Christmas period, I'll give an A plus just for coming along this evening. Adam, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that we will see that published at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, what I will do now, Adam, I'll, I'll have a look at uh, if we've got any questions. And as I'm doing that, uh, just a couple of comments from myself. I, we've got a couple of Bren here with us this evening that are very well known to you. And over the course of the years, Adam, in replying to toasts that they may have done to the province of Fife and Kinross, I keep on trying to remind them that masonry started here in uh, the kingdom. And you have I uh, very eloquently reminded them that it did so. Uh, and that technology probably started here as well. And I can see Brother Rutherford smirking at me right now uh, and raising a glass of uh, red wine to that. Uh, the other comment that I've got is again, it's a local one to me, Adam. And you mentioned General Alexander Leslie. I'm an elder of uh, Markinch Parish Church and he's buried beneath our pews. We don't know exactly where he is, uh, but legend has it, he's the third pew down when you come in the, the right hand door, uh, as the old beadle would tell you. Uh, and he passed away at Bulgoni Castle, just not far from where I am here in Mark Inch. Uh, so we have some questions for you. Uh, I think we need a bigger Zoom contract. <laughs> yes, we had a full house this evening for you, Adam. So thank you. Uh, a, a star, uh, well, research informative. Uh, Fife, what about Aitchison's Haven? Uh, well, that was from brother uh, Alan Maitland, so we'll, we'll leave that one for, for another day. Uh, there's not many questions coming in just now, Adam. It's all congratulations and well done and thank yous. Uh, just now, really excellent presentation, well done. Uh, so Ian Glennie asks, Adam, you mentioned the connection with Huygens and also the issues with maritime timekeeping. Is there a connection with Harrison? There, there is, and, and unfortunately, um, although great progress was made with the Huygens uh, design and Ustavik's uh, clock, and, and at least three were made and trialled, 
and Alexander Bruce paid for the, uh, the the trials they were they were undertaken by the Royal Navy. Um, the although the mechanism and you can see this hopefully if you visit um, the National Museum in Chamber Street, the mechanism is extraordinarily detailed and how they managed to do the the, the miniaturization of the work, given the tools uh, and the and the natural light that they had at the time is just extraordinary. But the problem was the housing and keeping the clock stable in the in the elements uh, on board and um, Alexander Bruce designed a, a housing uh, on a gimbal so the, the the clock swung with the movement of the ship but even that was uh, was insufficient what's interesting um, and I tried to find a, 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 a tried to find it in my notes for this evening um, there's a frontispiece to a contemporary history of the Royal Society, showing uh, King Charles II surrounded by some of the instruments that the Royal Society um, was experimenting with and behind him, hanging on the wall behind him, is one of the Huygens Ustavik clocks. But it, the, the, ultimately the, the trial was not successful and it was effectively abandoned. Um, but the issue of longitude clearly didn't go away um, and Harrison eventually solved it and and, and claimed, claimed the prize, scooped the winnings. Um, but what fascinated me was, I suppose we, understandably, we see a lot of our history through a British lens, but um, Professor Parker in his wider scope across uh, a European landscape tells of how uh, the Dutch were absolutely fastidious about the use of technology. So it's not surprising that Huygens, the Huygenses, because there was more than there was a, a multi-generational family of, of engineers, why they find themselves in Amsterdam, because they had you know, a natural client base uh, and the mercantile community in the uh, VOC, the Dutch East India Company. And um, that extraordinary statistic that, that I passed over, you may, have, you may have clocked it, sorry, no pun intended, you may have noticed it, um, that by the mid 17th century, the Dutch through their application of technology and also training because they employed professional captains and professional crews, whereas the Portuguese were still very much given to, um, to employing aristocratic uh, captains as a result of their rank rather than their ability seafaring um, and as a result the the Dutch lost only one in 20 vessels sailing between both uh, Latin America between Suriname and the East Indies whereas the Portuguese uh, loss rate was was far more considerable um, and and so all of that I think combined to to enable the the production of a clock of that clock and of other navigational aids but I suppose it was a combination perhaps of 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 the lack of, of of willingness to see it through. I don't, I don't know. I, uh, I genuinely don't know why the trials, those particular trials, came to an end, but they did, and it wasn't for another, at least another eighty years before the the longitude um, uh, problem was effectively solved. Okay, we've got a question uh, from Eagle, one of our overseas brand, Adam. He's asking, who, who, in your opinion, was the inventor of the digital revolution? <laughs> this takes me well out of uh, out of my comfort zone. Um, I, I'm really struck. I mean, you 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 very kindly, um, Master, um, uh, put me into the real world before before introducing me into the lodge. In that my work is in in uh, in renewable energy, and uh, you and I may have met when I was a solicitor, but that was last century. <laughs> um, uh, and and. I'm exposed in, you know, in in the world of energy and particularly renewables to to digitization, to things being digital, and to the importance of data and machine learning. And as I work my way around to not answering this question, I'd like to give you an example of how digital and data and machine learning has transformed my small sector of the of the you know of the of the global economy. When I joined um, my first uh, employer in renewables, a company called Airtricity. We just finished building a small wind farm, the first, the company's first wind farm in Scotland, just on the hill above Ardrossan, um, some four or five wind turbines. And in order to maintain and inspect those turbines as part of their regular inspection um, uh, process, uh, you had to call out at least two people um, and they had to stop the turbine 
so you were losing money because you were not generating electricity. They had to climb up a ladder. In fact, probably they were in the early turbines. There were, I say early turbines, this is 2006, this is about 14 years ago. Um, they had to rope themselves up inside the ladder, step out onto the, the, the top of the turbine, and then one of them would rope themselves down each of the individual blades, inspect it for cracks, come back up again, manually crank the turbine round, do the same again. So understandably human nature being what it is, you weren't really covering the blade properly, you weren't inspecting all the, the cracks. Now, today, most wind uh, farms, most wind turbines, whether onshore or increasingly now offshore, are inspected by semi-autonomous drones, uh, learning as they're going, inspecting um, the uh, now not stationary turbines. Um, and feeding all of that data back to somebody sitting in a warm room uh, in front of a computer screen. And that's in 14 years. In fact, in less than it's probably in a, in a decade. And so who invented the digital revolution? I, I don't know who would claim to, to have done it. Uh, Bill Gates, um, Steve Jobs. They, they certainly transformed digital into something we all understand. But what is most extraordinary to me is how it's, we're right in the middle of it. And I, and I like to think that it's we're faced by some of the similar transition that Murray and his his confrere in the Royal Society and others faced as things were just invented. Some things clearly didn't work. I mean, they did extraordinary things like chopping. Uh, this is quite bloodthirsty. I don't know why I'm thinking of this one, but they they opened up a dog, a living, a live dog, and and attached its its. Um, uh, removed its lungs and attached it to a set of bellows to see how, you know, they <laughs> they were practic pra doing stuff, clearly you wouldn't be allowed to do today, um, but, but, you know, right hands-on experimentation in real life, um, a change, and, and the change to them was just as profound as the digital revolution today. Sorry, that's a very, very long... No, I, I think it answered it very well. And uh, taking us right back to the beginning, we've got a, a question from one of our uh, English brand who joins us regularly, who's probably got probably got the most apt name for this time of year, Matthew Christmas. And oh my, Matthew, Matthew is brother Matthew Christmas. Oh dear, this, <laughs> this is going to be very embarrassing now. So he's Reveal got a he's got a question for you. <laughs> well, I, I bet he's got more than a question. <laughs> Reveal yourself. I can't see you. Where are you? Uh, Matthew, are you there? I... Yes, I'm here. <laughs> I can ask it if you like. Yeah, go on, please, Matthew. Hi, Adam. It's nice to hear you. Brilliant lecture. Thank you very much. I was going to ask you if uh, Robert Moray, you think he must have met him, uh, Elias Ashmole, the first English recorded speculative Freemason, and they were both members of the Royal Society, and, uh, uh, although Ashmole wasn't so active as obviously as Moray. Do you, is there any correspondence, do you know, between the two of them? I've, I've, um, any connections they had other than they were both royalists um, and supported the restoration and got active office. Do you know of any meetings they had together, anything like that? Um, uh, before I answer your question, uh, I should let everybody present know that we were at university together and you have a much more impressive book bookshelf than I do. Uh, I am in awe. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the answer, Matthew, is that I suspect that along with all his other papers, uh, they've been lost. Very so All we know is what's in the public record, in other people's correspondence, in the records of the Royal Society, and in this extraordinary correspondence with, with Alexander Bruce, for which Murray's letters have survived, Bruce's letters haven't. And it's a real shame because although Murray was not the, you know, he would never be in the preeminent uh, rank of, of the, the, the real scientific geniuses who were the first members of the Royal Society, Newton, Hooke, um, Wren, uh, and, and others. He was, he was, he had this extraordinary force of personality that clearly, um, somebody likened him to the grand impresario, because he would bring people together. He was on, you know, the reason he was elected president, first president of the Royal Society, as I'm sure, because he was everybody's friend. You know, he, he was trusted by everybody. And, and he clearly had correspondence, global correspondence. We know that he was writing to uh, some of the early um, settlers in, the, in, in New England. He was writing to people in the West Indies. He was writing to people in Africa. He was writing to people all around the world about uh, natural phenomena, the tidal race in Nova Scotia, the um, girth of fir trees in New England, the 
you know, the, the, and, and many, many other things. So I'm sure that he corresponded with Ashmel. I'm more than certain of it, but we have no evidence. We can only speculate as to what they wrote and talked about. And it is jolly good to see you. It's been a very, very long time. Nice to see you too. Thanks for the answer. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I think Adam, one of our past provincial grandmasters, is talking about one of uh, our past grandmaster masons going back to pre-industrial revolution and using sm smoke signals uh, to communicate with us in the, the chat box there. I, I'll leave the past provincial grandmaster of Stirlingshire to explain that to Brother Charles Ian. Uh, Ian McIntosh, uh, another Masonic figure who's with the Scottish Army in 1641 and was a member of the Lodge of Edinburgh, was John Milne, who was named as Master Gunner. He was also Master Mason to the Crown of Scotland and the Burgess of Dundee. And yeah, it's, in... it's, I mean, clearly there, there's a, it's not coincidental, is it, that uh, Murray and, and Hamilton and others are initiated into the Lodge of Edinburgh because they were, they, they were the engineers, they were the artist, the artificers. They knew not only how to deal with, I suppose, the munitions and the siege train, but also they understood ballistics. They understood you know, the application of, through the application of their working tools, they understood trajectory and, and how you could most effectively lob large amounts of, of, of iron or rock over the walls of, uh, of, of Newcastle. Um, but Clearly, there was something that clicked. Uh, I don't think they would have asked. They didn't. I, I don't. I don't think they asked Murray simply because they wanted a general to be in their lodge. I think they asked Murray, and clearly, it would have been a significant step to ask a non-operative Mason to join. And and I and again, it speaks to the man, doesn't it? It speaks to the character of the man. And just in answer to Matthew's question earlier, th that he was clearly trusted and. And people find him interesting, uh, and and that I think is is probably what marks him out from his contemporaries. Well, Brother Adam Bruce, on behalf of the members of the Lodge Hope of Karachi, and incidentally your father's lodge as well, because he's a member of 337. Can I thank you once again for coming all along this evening and giving that wonderful insight into Sir Robert Murray. And we very much look forward to the time that we, we can see uh, your musings in print and that we can be back together as research lodges uh, meeting in each other's company. Uh, at this time, uh, can I just thank the three past Grand Masters that we've got with us this evening? Uh, Brother Brent Stewart, the past Grand Master of Missouri. Brother Brent, welcome to our small lodge here in Fife and Ken Ross. Uh, Brother Plamine from Bulgaria. You uh, Plamine's a regular uh, visitor and he's probably the most well travelled Zoomer in the of Grand Master Masons, because wherever you go on a Zoom call around the world, Plamine is there. And obviously to Charles Ian, our own past Grand Master Mason, thank you for coming along this evening. Brethren, uh, our next meeting uh, after the, the bells uh, next Tuesday will be uh, Brother Tom Edgar, uh, the Deputy Master of uh, St. John's Fisher Row. Uh, Brother Tom uh, has got the f fancy title of being a city officer of the city of Edinburgh. And he's going to come along and talk to us about the Lord Provost of Edinburgh and their Masonic connections. And we're really hopeful that uh, we will also have, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, the current Lord Provost, who's not a Mason, joining us as well. Uh, and just an apology, Hugh, I didn't see you there. And we've got a past grandmaster from Canada as well, one of our own Scottish brands, Hugh Young. Hugh, sorry, I didn't see you on my list there. Uh, it's also good to have you. Brian, I, can I extend to each and every one of you the best wishes for a prosperous 2021? And I just hope that all your health keeps well and that we get through this devastating pandemic in good spirit and good heart. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I will now allow you to unmute yourself so you can say your thank yous to brother Adam Bruce. And Adam, at this time, can you pass on our best wishes to your family and also to your father 
and the Countess and wish them all the very best from everyone here at the Lodge Hope of Karachi. I shall. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. It was a real pleasure. And it, it's it's just wonderful to be, uh, to be with you. And I hope, if I may echo your words, to see as many of you as possible um, in the course of the coming year. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Bern, the floor is yours to say thank you. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, thank you Adam. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, 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 Adam. Very much indeed. That was excellent. Thank you. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you very much, Adam. That was super. Thank you. Stay safe, Adam. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. That was, Happy that was an excellent lecture, Adam. Well presented. Thank, thank you. you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for that, Adam. Excellent presentation, Adam. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, brother Douglas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Happy New Year to Happy New Year to you too. For the best one. Thank you very thank you. much, Adam, and thank you, Gordon. Happy New Year. Thank you very much, Adam. Excellent. Really was enthralled by the whole evening. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture, Adam. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. Just as a coincidence, Adam, I installed the first wind turbine in Africa, in Somalia, uh, 30 odd years ago. 200 kilowatt. Wow. Well, we've, just, we've just finished building our six in South Africa and one in um, Senegal, but we haven't uh, we haven't got to East Africa yet. Okay, Bren, I'm going to give you your normal five. Congratulations, Adam. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. You. Thanks, Adam. Great chat. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Happy New Year to all the brethren. Yeah, Thank you, Adam. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you, Gordon. Three. Thank you, Blowing. You and I've just noticed we've got another past grandmaster, John Cameron from Canada and Alberta as well. Apologies. I, we've got a good few of them out this evening. Good to see. <laughs> Give you two. Happy New Year to And one. Thanks, Gordon. And we'll finish the recording. Thank you, Bern. Happy New Year.